What is truly the best country in Epcot? We are ranking them all scientifically. There are tons of countries and not a lot of hours in the day, so stick around so you know what to prioritize. But heads up, this ranking might make you a little mad. I'm already angry. It's science. I can't, I can't change the number. All the way in the back of Epcot is, l is a little thing. Not so little. It's actually a really large thing. It's called the World Showcase. It's made up of 11 countries, and in each country you can observe and taste and feel all the five senses, the different cultures, the different foods. It basically is like an inside look to each of these 11 countries. They range from everything to Mexico, all the way to the United Kingdom, to France, and even America. We'll be ranking these pavilions scientifically and objectively. We're doing this based on response from readers as well as our team. Uh, and I literally used a spreadsheet to come up with these scores because I'm a massive nerd. But we've got five categories. Uh, attractions, entertainment, food and beverage, theming, and popularity. Each one is scored on one to five in each factor for a total potential score of 25. And that is how we're ranking these pavilions. <laughs> Starting off with the least rated country, number 11, Canada. Getting this party started with attractions, our first category. Now, there isn't really a huge attraction here in Canada, but there is a movie called Canada Far and Wide. Now, the thing that I love about Canada Far and Wide uh, is that it is hosted by Eugene Levy and um, Catherine O'Hara, <clears throat> but it is just a movie. There's nothing crazy special about it. You stand there and you watch a film for maybe, you know, 10 minutes and, and that's about it. It is a pretty fun movie. I actually do enjoy it, but it's definitely not a showstopper. Uh, so for those reasons, we're gonna give the attractions three. Moving on to entertainment, there's actually not a lot of entertainment here in Canada other than uh, the band that's out here. Uh, but again, it's it's not always out here. It, it props up every once in a while. So a band out here is not always guaranteed. Because you never know if you're gonna get live entertainment. You could show up and nothing's happening. Fortunately, we've gotta give entertainment a one. Now moving on to food and beverage, this is the lowest rated country. Uh, based on food and beverage. Other than Le Cellier, they just got popcorn. Now, when the festival is happening, yes, there are some other food beverages, but we're just talking about the pavilion alone. Now, just because Le Cellier can be pretty difficult to get into, and the only other food option they have here is popcorn, unfortunately, unfortunately we gotta rate this one pretty low as well. So, as far as food and beverage go, we're gonna give that a one. Now, as far as theming goes, that is, theming is our next category. There is some, uh, you know, really pretty rock work, which we're gonna check out here, but uh, it's really just, uh, gardens that you can kind of see anywhere at Epcot. Like this garden here specifically reminds me of uh, what they have like right next to the um, Journey into Imagination with Figment. It's it's a it's a hill with grass and really pretty flowers. But let's but really the coolest thing about this is is the uh, is the rock work and the waterfall, which I've always said there should be a raft ride back here. I think that would be really fun. <laughs> the rock work and the waterfall definitely uh, adds to the theming back here. Look at this. This is this is gorgeous. So for theming, we're gonna give it a two, and the two is mostly for the waterfall and the rock work. And finally, popularity. That's our last category, popularity. People aren't necessarily running to Canada unless they're going to La Cellier to have a nice meal. There's honestly just not a lot to see here in Canada. So for popularity, we're gonna give it a one. And with that, our World Showcase ranking has begun. What do you got, Quincy? Brief interlude as we head through the African outpost. So this is actually not a pavilion. We won't be ranking it today. It's not a full pavilion. Ah, uh, Italy. The next stop of our tour of the world. Italy is coming in second to last place at 10 on our list. So we made it to the top 10. Only one that didn't make it in was Canada. Sorry, Canada. For attractions, you bet we're gonna get a one out of five on this one. There are no attractions in Italy. There's no galleries, no rides, no shows, nothing. You're just strolling around, shopping, seeing some entertainment, taking in the theming. So that's gonna be a one out of five on the attractions front. Entertainment wise, Italy actually does pretty well. So right here next to the tower, you can catch Sergio. Now Sergio is an incredibly unique entertainment offering. He is the only entertainment that's regularly here in Italy. Uh, he's a variety act. He can juggle and he like gets kids involved and it's actually a really cute, really funny show, which I highly recommend. It is only one entertainment offering, but it's a good one that's unique to the pavilion. So, gonna be a three out of five on entertainment. Uh, food was judged not only on quality, but also on variety and value. Uh, there were quotients for all of these put into a spreadsheet and it automatically generated the rating for the land. 
Italy has some actually really great food. There are a lot of restaurants here. Via Napoli is an incredibly popular Italian table service restaurant with huge meter long pizzas if you want them. Uh, pizza Al Taglio is the pizza window. It's not open all the time, but it is much loved as you can see from the line. All that said, despite Via Napoli being very popular and definitely one that you should think about visiting if you're a big Italian food fan, uh, the food rating in this pavilion is going to get a two out of five. Uh, this pavilion, unfortunately, is going to get our lowest ranking on theming of all the pavilions. Uh, it is beautiful, there's some very nice theming here, but it feels a little sparse and I've heard from many, many, many people that it does not feel like walking around Italy the way that other pavilions feel like walking around those countries. And I've heard this from people from Italy, people who have visited Italy. My favorite part is the statue of Neptune, but other than that, it's, um, it feels a little bare bones. Also remember, that doesn't mean that this pavilion has a 1 out of 5 for all theming anywhere. It's a 1 out of 5 compared to the theming in other pavilions. So it's still really beautiful theming. It's still worth visiting, still worth walking around. It's just not going to be quite as good as theming in the other pavilions. Now if you look at the number of people walking around here, the number of, number of people hanging out in Italy, you'll get a bit of an idea of the popularity of this pavilion. It's beautiful. Um, it's actually very popular for weddings since a lot of people have emotional connections to Italy and want to get married in the Epcot representation of it, but it's often not considered a favorite pavilion for most people, giving it a low popularity rating of two out of five. The only non-table service or bar option that Italy has to offer besides the pizza window, which is only open sometimes, is Gelateria Toscana. This is actually a relatively new location. It is a gelato location and it has very, very tasty gelato treats. The only problem, it's expensive. So what really tanks Italy's food and beverage score is going to be the value. $8.50 for a cup of gelato is just darn expensive. All in all, Italy comes in with a low, low score of 9. I definitely still recommend making time to at least stroll through every pavilion, but if you don't have time, this is another one that you might be able to just breeze past. Maybe walk out here on this front patio, see the gondolas in the water. Coming in ninth place, we've made it to China. Now, China is our first pavilion that actually features two um, attractions. Both attractions can be found by heading towards this temple. Oh my gosh, Mulan just walked out and waved at me. What's happening? The show that's located in here is called Reflections of China and it is relatively outdated which is why it doesn't help to push this score any higher. Now that said, it is a circle vision film which means the screen goes all around the room which is pretty cool um, and it could be a nice break in the AC but not exactly the most show-stopping or popular attraction here in Epcot. The gallery located right here is actually a spotlight called Inside Shanghai Disney Resort and shows you a lot of really interesting things about Shanghai Disney. I think this is a really cool gallery. I really like walking in here uh, to get out of the sun and check out some of the things that I'm missing out on uh, here in Disney World. Entertainment wise, this pavilion does have just one entertainment option. It is a character meet and greet with Mulan. You can find it here in the Chinese gardens. And obviously that's a very cool meet and greet because it's pretty difficult to find Mulan around Disney World. Since there is a character meet and greet, but there's only one, it's gonna be a two out of five on entertainment. When it comes to food and beverage, we've got three main locations here. There's Joy of Tea, which is a kiosk that has alcoholic beverages, uh, specialty teas, and egg rolls. We've also got Nine Dragons Restaurant, which is a table service restaurant, and we have Lotus Blossom Cafe. Now, these three restaurants are not typically like lauded. They are, in my opinion, pretty tasty, but they're often compared to any Americanized Chinese food that you can find in your hometown. So that means that for the food and beverage, this one's gonna get a two out of five compared to some of the more various and authentic options you can find elsewhere around the World Showcase. Now for theming, I actually really love the theming of the China Pavilion. I think it's a little underrated, uh, but this isn't about me. There are absolutely beautiful gardens, incredibly intricate buildings, um, and just a lot to look at. I actually think once you get into the back of this pavilion, it feels a lot like you are walking you kind of have to stand in the right place for that, and this pavilion is not as large as some of the others. For that reason, it's going to land right in the middle with a 3 out of 5 on theming. All in, people like the China Pavilion, but it's not exactly a much loved one. In popularity, it's going to get just a 2 out of 5, so total score lands at 12 out of 25. Do I need orange chicken right now? No, no, I got things to do. Coming in at number 8. The Germany Pavilion. Immediately when I walk in this pavilion, I either want a pretzel or I want caramel corn. Like, a thousand percent. That That's, <laughs> you can, literally the fragrance coming from Germany, I, I think is what draws a lot of people to it. Starting off with attractions. 
there are no attractions. <laughs> there is not an attraction here in Germany, which is honestly a huge letdown because there was supposed to be an attraction here in Germany. And I'll take you to it. All the way in the back of Germany, you can see this huge mural. This, I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna knock on it. It's hollow. That's because there's supposed to be an attraction here. It was, it was, a, it was actually a water attraction here uh, in Germany. Now, just because of budget, uh, you know, budget monetary things, the light did not come to be. So that just means there is no attraction. Because there was an attempt at attraction, I'll give it a one. But maybe someday we'll get a Germany attraction. Moving down to our next topic, entertainment. Now, there, again, unfortunately, isn't a lot of entertainment here at Germany, other than the uh, Snow White meet and greet. Uh, from, oh, the line is forming. Oftentimes you can find Snow White meeting out here uh, by her wishing well. You can see the queue lining up for her already. Now this is really the only entertainment other than seasonal entertainment that you might find at festivals or actually inside the beer garden. They do have this built stage that actually stays here uh, year round, but this is really mostly only for festivals. Specialty acts will be here like uh, drummers or, or potentially different bands. But because we're just specifically talking about the pavilion itself and not what, uh, not what the festival adds to the, to the pavilion, uh, I can't include that. Now, if you have a reservation to eat at the beer garden, you will see some entertainment actually inside. There is a full um, German-influenced band in, in there. Some specialty acts, glockenspiels, heavily German-themed uh, music and uh, instruments inside uh, of the beer garden restaurant. But because you actually have to make a reservation to actually get inside the beer garden and all that stuff, but really there just isn't a lot of entertainment offerings here in the Germ Germany pavilions. Uh, but because they have the meet and greet and uh, some uh, some entertainment inside the actual beer garden, we'll give it a two. Now the food and beverage offerings here in the Germany pavilion are uh, limited compared to other countries, but they do have some pretty interesting uh, fan favorites. For example, uh, let's, let's just go inside. I want to smell it. Now the caramel popcorn here in the Germany Pavilion is a fan favorite. It's like a staple here uh, at, at World Showcase. And you can see them hand make it right behind this counter here. If caramel popcorn is not your thing, they still have a bunch of other treats you can get here as well with this, uh, with the uh, Weathers uh, caramel. In addition to the amazing caramel popcorn, in the back of the Germany Pavilion is a buffet. The table service restaurant called the Beer Garden. And inside the Beer Garden, their big thing is they're celebrating Oktoberfest every single day. It is a buffet, which means there is a set price per person. Here's what I will say. Inside the Beer Garden is, I, I feel the most inside Germany when I'm at the Beer Garden. It is the most Germany uh, you can get. There is the, the, the um pa pa. Something's happening. Oh. <laughs> Also in Germany, you have the uh, DuckTales uh, game that you can play on your uh, Disney Play app on your phone. And you, as you can see, it's just, it just it definitely adds a whole nother level to the to the pavilion. Like everything is more active, it comes alive. I, I love the DuckTales game uh, that you can play on the uh, Disney Play app. So so much fun. Uh, but I think inside the beer garden is probably the most German vibes you're going to get just because of the music. Uh, the food isn't really German inspired, German themed. I mean, there's some like, you know, you can get some bratwurst and things like that, but it is, uh, it is a, a, a typical buffet. There's not really any liquor here uh, in the Germany Pavilion, but there are uh, quite a few uh, German beer options, specifically a very fan favorite, the grapefruit beer, and you can always get a pretzel with it, but other than that, uh, that's about it. And compared to other pavilions, fortunately, that's just not a lot. So for food and beverage, we're gonna give that a three. On to theming. I actually really do enjoy the theming here in Germany, especially here if you stand at the fountain, you really get like a 360 degree of just like pure uh, like a German castle, uh, clock makers, different art, uh, different shops, and the German music definitely helps. And inside the shops, the theming continues. There's the Christmas corner where you can always per purchase your Christmas pickle. I love the story behind the uh, pickle ornament, which I, everyone is always confused. Like, what is how, a Christmas pickle? What do you mean? Now, according to German tradition, the pickle brings good luck and was the last ornament placed on the tree. On Christmas morning, the first child to find the gherkin was rewarded with a little extra gift by uh, St. Nicholas. This tradition basically encouraged the children to appreciate all the ornaments on the tree rather than hurrying to see what St. Nicholas had left for them. And I think that is a very, very fun, sweet tradition that uh, I'm like, well, that, I would put that in, I, I would make that part of my family tradi traditions. And the German theming continues in here with it, with giant, giant beer steins. Mugs, shirts, blankets, pretzels with ears. 
<laughs> Inside the wine cellar, there are a bunch of aged wines. And actually, I, I take back my earlier statement about there not being a lot of um, liquor options. Oh, that, that's, that is still true, but you can try this kind of like, uh, this like chocolate liqueur. You can actually, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, things you can try here. You can try a bunch of different wines. This chocolate, uh, this chocolate liqueur, pumpkin liqueur, this apple liqueur. Right, you can also purchase the finer things. I feel like there's always like a finer things shop in each pavilion. Oh, wow. And this Spaceship Earth from yours for $79,000. Because it's pretty well themed and the merchandise uh, shops continue on that theme. Uh, also, I just, that, that just, that just yells Germany. I'm gonna give theming a three. And lastly, we'll talk about popularity. Germany is like a staple pavilion here at World Showcase. Germany is a, is a huge staple pavilion, but there is still not a lot to do here because, you know, not a lot of entertainment, not a lot of attractions. Uh, it's really just kind of a walk through, grab a beer, look around for a second, get it, get out. So for those reasons, we're going to call popularity a three. That gives Germany an overall score of 12. So that's, that's your number eight. That Germany is number eight. Also, oh, this doesn't count as entertainment. Maybe this counts as theming. I don't know, but I always like it. I love these train sets. Gotta look. Gotta love these train sets, these miniature train sets here in the Germany Pavilion. I should have known I'd find you here. <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> Seventh place goes to the Morocco Pavilion. Uh, this is actually a really low rating for what is one of my top two pavilions, but it is what it is. That's what science means, folks. Now, Morocco is limited when it comes to attractions, uh, but we are qualifying galleries as attractions, and Morocco does have a gallery. Uh, right now, it is the Race Against the Sun gallery. It has been for a bit. Um, and you can find that over here, right here at the Gallery of Arts and History. This gallery shows you culture of the desert as well as talking a bit about the Marathon of the Sands, which is a six day, 250 kilometer ultra run, and the Rally of the Gazelles, which is an all women's off road race. Uh, that can be found. It's super, super cool. I love stepping in here and seeing some of the stuff they have on display and learning about these different interesting things that honestly, before I came in here, I didn't know was a thing. So while there are no rides, that one gallery and the fact that it's a full gallery gets this to an attraction rating of two of five. Wandering through Morocco a bit more, you'll find Lamps of Wonder. Um, this is where you can meet Jasmine. She's meeting right now, as you can tell by the line. Um, and you can go in and meet Jasmine. So there's a character meet and greet here. And during festivals, but not all the time, there can be live music and sometimes belly dancers, which is really, really neat. Since we've got both live music, a belly dancer, um, even if they're not always here, and a character meet and greet, we are going to give Morocco a four out of five on entertainment. Food-wise, Morocco actually has some solid options. Uh, there's the stand back here where you can get Mediterranean olives, which is important to no one but me. There used to be restaurant Marrakesh, which was a full Moroccan table service restaurant located in the back of the pavilion. Although that uh, restaurant has been closed since 2020 and there is no announcement of reopening yet. There is Tangerine Cafe, which is often functioning as a festival booth and has a rotating menu of some Mediterranean favorites. Uh, there's Oasis Sweets and Treats where you can get some Moroccan pastries and things like that. And then there's my favorite Spice Road Table, which is a table service by the water restaurant that you can often walk right up to or get on the wait list on your My Disney Experience app without a reservation in advance. Um, it's right on the water. It's got beautiful theming and really amazing small plates. So highly recommend Spice Road Table. Um, even just hopping in there to grab a drink. That said, Morocco more leans on solid food options, but it's a little lower in variety and there's nothing that's absolutely show stopping. So for the food and beverage category, it's gonna get a three out of five. Where Morocco really excels is in the theming. So you can see right as you walk up to the pavilion that it's got some of the most grand theming of any of the pavilions. Um, it is actually my favorite simply because I just love sitting over here. It is absolutely gorgeous and the pavilion was actually partially designed by the architect at the time of the King of Morocco. So it's one of the most authentically designed pavilions. So between the authenticity of the pavilion and just how absolutely beautiful it is, the theming is going to get a 5 out of 5. Now this is maybe one of my favorite pavilions, but that's not the case for most people. People like it, appreciate its beauty, but um, especially with the fact that a lot of the things you used to be able to do here aren't available anymore. Um, some of the shops are closed, things like that. Uh, it's a liked million, but not often a favorite. So for popularity, it's just gonna get a low two out of five. 
all in all, that lands Morocco with a score of 16, which is pretty good. And on to the next. Dun, 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 dun. We've arrived in the United Kingdom Pavilion, which comes in next at sixth place. Oh, we're almost to the top five. One thing you might know about the United Kingdom Pavilion is that it does not have any attractions. There are no galleries or museums here. There is no ride. There are no shows that happen inside or anything like that. So no attractions. And you know what that means? It's gonna be an attraction rating of one out of five. Now, this is actually one of the more lively pavilions in World Showcase when it comes to entertainment. Uh, not only are there two regular character meet and greets with Alice and Mary Poppins, you can also find live music. Oftentimes there's live music playing in the maze garden out back and there's typically a pianist who performs at Rose and Crown. So two different live music offerings, two different character offerings. That's pretty darn good when it comes to World Showcase pavilions. And it's gonna land this pavilion with a score of four out of five on the entertainment section. There's Alice right now. All of the dining for the UK Pavilion is going to be found pretty front, like on the main pathway. You've got Yorkshire County Fish Shop, as well as Rose and Crown Pub and Rose and Crown Dining Room. Not a lot of variety here. It's just a table service, a quick service, and a bar. Well, actually, I guess that's kind of okay variety. It's just that there aren't very many locations. But all the locations are very, very popular. People love stopping by Rose and Crown for a pint of beer, especially if they're uh, towards the end of the night. It gets very busy in there. The pub is well liked, and Yorkshire County Fish Shop is a very, very popular quick service, even though they just serve in fish and chips. For those reasons, food and beverage is actually going to get a four out of five. That's pretty darn good. Theming-wise, the UK lands right in the middle. The theming is very immersive, and it's especially cool because if you actually look at the different buildings as you walk through the UK pavilion, they represent different time periods. So you've got here, starting with the tea caddy, the oldest UK era represented, and then as you go around, it gets more and more recent and represents different ages of English architecture. Coming all the way around to the most recent. Still, it's not quite as photo op ready as some other pavilions. There aren't any real show stopping elements to the theming. So lands right in the middle. Solid theming with a three out of five. This is actually also a more popular pavilion. A lot of people love stopping by here, mostly due to that Rose and Crown pub, and it certainly gets more popular as the evening goes on. Um, but people like the UK Pavilion, so it's going to get a 4 out of 5 on popularity, coming in for a total score of 16. So tied with Moraga before it, and notched just a bit higher based on reviews from our readers. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing final five of the World Showcase ranking. Number five. The American Pavilion. All right, first things first, attractions. The big attraction here in the America Pavilion is the American Adventure. It's funny, the more I think about it, I'm actually not surprised this ranked top five because there's actually, it's a rather large pavilion and there is a lot to do here. The American Adventure is actually a show uh, that combines uh, screens and a, a bunch. I'm talking a lot of audio animatronics. And it tells the story of America, how America came to be and how America continues to grow and change and adjust. And it's narrated by Mark Twain and Benjamin Franklin. They also have a pretty fantastic uh, heritage museum inside the American Adventure as well. They pay tribute to Native Americans, their culture, their art. Uh, and what's, what's really cool, that there's even some uh, artifacts that were donated by the Smithsonian. So that's cool. Overall, I really like the American Adventure. It's a nice break out of your day. So for attractions, we're going to give this pavilion a four. Now, entertainment, I'm going to, there's going to be some, um, we're rating entertainment pretty, pretty high here in the American Pavilions for a couple of different reasons, specifically because of what's behind me right here. This is the American Gardens Theater, and that is where you're going to find a lot of the concert series that happen throughout the festivals. Um, as well as the candlelight processional that happens for the holiday season. So for entertainment here in the American Pavilion, we're giving it a five. Here in the American Pavilion, there are lots of kiosks uh, with funnel cakes and ice cream and lots of great festival stuff, but there's a fantastic quick service uh, location, and that is the Regal Eagle Smokehouse. This is where you can grab uh, your really great barbecue. They do have some plant-based options, but uh, I, I cannot recommend the Regal Eagle Smokehouse enough. So for food and beverage, we're going to give that a three. Now theming, uh, theming, theming unfortunately is where uh, 
the American Pavilion falls a little short. But really, there's a lot of open space. It's a lot of brick, and this is, there's this giant theater. Does it, there's nothing that screams America other than these two pretty large buildings that hold the theater and then hold another theater, which, if you know me, there's nothing wrong with holding the theater, but still, there's not a lot to it. So uh, the two buildings are great, so for each building, we'll give it a point. So that's theming. Theming is two. We're giving it a two. And the, the American Pavilion is a staple pavilion. It is literally the halfway point. Uh, so people tend to stop here to either see the American Adventure, or also they stop here to see whatever show is, show is happening here. Uh, so they're not really stopping for the food or the beverage. Uh, they're really stopping to see one of the two shows. So because the reason you're coming to the American Pavilion is probably for the shows, and maybe Regal Eagle Smokehouse, we're getting popularity a three. Let's keep moving. We are at our fourth rank, number four. It's the Japan Pavilion. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the largest and most in-depth pavilions. And when I say in-depth, I mean it is deep. Japan runs deep. I mean, look how far that goes. We're talking stores. We're talking food. We've, we've got a lot to cover. Now, obviously, we're going category by category, so let's break it down. Category number one, attractions. And there's not really any attraction, or attraction here, not really a ride vehicles anywhere happening in Japan. There's a gallery which we're kind of considering as an attraction because you can't attend it. And this gallery is all the way in the back of the pavilion. And this gallery is all based around Japan's cute culture. Kawaii. It means cute. It reigns anywhere from stuffed animals like Duffy in the back there. Hey Duffy. To figurines, to different patterns, different pop culture icons like Pikachu. Hey Pikachu. It's a very cute gallery, but as far as attraction wise, I wouldn't necessarily consider it an attraction. It is a gallery, but it does have something. So for attractions, we're gonna give it two. Now for entertainment, they do have a pretty unique offering. And it actually happens at the front of Japan. And it's actually the Japan drummers. Now they appear several times throughout the day and it definitely immerses you in this uh, unique Japanese style of music. Now that's the only real entertainment happening here uh, in uh, Japan. But because it is so unique, because it does have a lot to do with the culture here in Japan, and it is definitely, uh, people love it. Uh, they were, when it was uh, when it was gone because of the uh, shutdown, people were begging for it to come back. Uh, so for those reasons, we'll give it a three. Now for food and beverage, there is a wide variety of restaurants and kiosks here. Uh, anything from uh, shaved ice, uh, sake, Katsura Grill, which feels very quick service, sushi, uh, noodles. And then you've got your table service restaurant. Like up here, you've got hibachi. And then, and then some really fine dining around the corner, Takumi Te. We actually did a full review of Takumi Te. So if you're interested, go check that out on the channel. Even inside Mitsukoshi, which is uh, the basic, basically it's a de department store inside of the Japan Pavilion. They've got some really cool snack offerings and beverage options uh, that are true to the uh, to Japanese culture. There's definitely a lot to try here when it comes to food. So uh, food and beverage. For that reason, we're going to give it a four. Now let's get into theming. This is definitely one of the most well-themed, in my opinion, from the architecture to the greenery, the foliage, the gardens over here. They do a really good job of bringing the Japanese culture here to uh, this pavilion. I'm at the back of the pavilion, and even just like hanging out in the back of the pavilion, you see uh, just in the distance, this just like really cool Japanese um, architecture, this building, and the lanterns hung. Oh, here's one of the big traditional drums that they use in the uh, Japan Drum Show. It's not, it's not called the Japan Drum Show. I can't pronounce the Japan Drum Show. It is really, really immersive in this. I know we use that word a lot, immersive, uh, because that's what, that's what Disney continuously tries to do, makes us feel like we're not actually here at the parks. We're in a different country. And, and Japan is definitely one of those ones because it's so expansive, because it, it is so deep. So for those reasons, we're giving theming a four. And as we get into popularity, it is a pretty popular uh, pavilion, mostly due to Mitsukoshi. Let's, let's, head in there, let's head in there real quick. The reason for the season is Mitsukoshi, which is an actual department store in Japan. They brought here to Epcot, and we were talking about that cute culture. Uh, there's a lot of that in here as well. So for popularity, we're also going to give it a four, which gives Japan an overall score of 17. All right, now we're moving on to the final three. Let's go. We have officially made it to our top three. Welcome. Ranking third in our World Showcase ranking is Norway. Now, honestly, Norway has always felt a little small to me, but it is rather deep. Full-on attractions, walk-through experiences, restaurants, quick service shops. I mean, it, it, there is a lot to do here in Norway. And I really feel like the reason why this is number three is because it is home to one of the most popular attractions here at Epcot, Frozen Ever After. 
Frozen Ever After is a slow-moving dark ride attraction uh, that actually takes place moments after the Frozen movie ends. Elsa is inviting everyone up to her ice palace for a big celebration. Now for all of you Disney history buffs, this is formerly uh, the, where the Maelstrom attraction was and it was a, uh, an attraction that took you through Norway and kind of taught you a little bit about Norway. Now this is literally almost the exact same track. It's almost identical with some with, with a couple changes. But let's get into more of Norway, uh, not just Frozen After After because there is a lot to see here. Here in Norway is also where you can actually meet Anna and Elsa. They have a great indoor meet and greet uh, location, which isn't a true for in a lot of the countries the princesses actually meet outside. But here in Norway, they've actually built this uh, cute little co uh, cottage area and it's the, you're actually going uh, to the Royal Summer House to meet Anna and Elsa. Now this, because it is such a uh, in-demand meet and greet, wait times for this can be pretty high. Now there isn't just uh, Disney intellectual property with here within Norway. There's actual some culture of Norway. For example, uh, this uh, church stay where you can learn about the Nordic gods, uh, gods of the Vikings. <laughs> it's always funny. Some a lot of people are like, "Oh, look, it's Marvel. Marvel's coming in." I was like, "Well, yes, but it's also it's also Norway." So. <laughs> All right, let's go inside, check it out. Inside here's where you can learn a lot about the mythology of the Vikings, Odin, Thor, Loki. Now all of these gods, they're, um, they're really all Viking based. Now when we get into food and beverage, the food is kind of limited, but with the food that is here, people are actually big fans of it. Specifically the uh, Kringla Bakery. And this is where you're gonna find your school bread, your frozen coffee, some really great pastry options in here. And recently we just tried the Viking coffee here at Kringla during the drink, Drinking Around the World Challenge, Quincy, Emma, and I did. And actually really good. Uh, you know, it's, like it's frozen coffee, you no, know, like they've got these interesting, um, almost like Rice Krispie Flakes on it. It was really, really good. So uh, you, you can check out, check out the video. Now I do think it's important to point out that uh, Kringla has a outdoor seating area for your snacks or beverages. And all the way in the back here, it's a bathroom. Bathrooms are important. Now, Akershus Royal Banquet Hall is a table service restaurant where you can meet your princesses. Basically, you'll dine here in a medieval castle where you'll encounter, you know, a royal promenade of princesses. It's a pretty solid table service restaurant. We were actually there for its reopening, uh, uh, and, and we, we got to try everything, and we we were pretty pleased with it. You can just check out the video. It's already up on our channel. All the way in the back, this is going to be your merchandise location, the Fjording. This is also where Frozen Ever After, the uh, basically the Frozen Ever After gift shop. In this section, you're going to find a bunch of different uh, higher-end uh, scents, uh, bags, and uh, perfumes, I guess, if you will. But in here, this is really the, uh, I would call this the fjording, the Norway section. They've got Kid Cot back here, a Kid Cot fun stop where your kiddos can, uh, can participate in an arts and crafts project. So rating all these from one to five, uh, starting with attractions, obviously Frozen Ever After, it's, uh, it's a great attraction. It's really one of the only attractions here that, that are, that are always, that's always in high demand other than uh, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. It's a pretty solid boat ride, it's family friendly, uh, so for that we're going to rate the attractions a five. And talking about entertainment, they've got a really great meet and greet, an indoor meet and greet, which is always, always important to get out of the sun for a little while. Their table service restaurant also has meet and greets with a church dedicated to Nordic gods, and uh, you can use your Disney Experience app to do your DuckTales challenge here in Norway as well. Pretty solid, so for entertainment, we'll say a three. Now, the food and beverage options here are limited. Uh, they are pretty okay, but they are limited uh, between Akershus and, um, and Kringla. So for those reasons, because of the limited food options, we're going to give it a two. A theming overall, we're talking about the grass roofs, uh, uh, the, the, the summer house, the uh, giant castle giant castle. Uh, theming is pretty solid. Um, it's not as detailed as some of the other pavilions, so we'll take it down a point for that. Uh, it's still, still detailed, but not as detailed. So for theming, we'll give it a four. And for popularity, it is a very popular uh, pavilion, in my opinion, specifically because of Frozen Ever After. Um, but for those reasons, we will give it a four. Give, giving Norway a total off score of 18. Number three, not bad. Oh, no, final two. Wait, who's the runner-up? Who, who is Quincy? In second place, the Mexico Pavilion. The Mexico Pavilion is actually one of my favorite pavilions, and clearly with good reason, according to the science and math. Let's start by talking about attractions. Uh, Mexico is going to get a four on attractions. A four out of five, which is a pretty great score. Um, it does have a full attraction in this land. There's the beloved, if not a must-do attraction, with Grand Fiesta Tour. 
This is a boat ride where you go with the three caballeros. That's Donald, Jose, and Panchito. And uh, Donald goes missing, so you gotta help find him. Uh, happens, happens to the best of us. Gotta go looking for Donald, you know how it is. To really grasp the high attraction score. And uh, this is not the only technical attraction in the Mexico Pavilion. Uh, I'm gonna take a tour, a Grand Fiesta tour, some might say. Delightful as always, but not the only attraction in this pavilion. Remember, attractions doesn't always mean rides, and the Mexico Pavilion actually has an incredibly cool Dia de los Muertos gallery uh, featuring characters from Coco, vignettes from Coco. You can see the graveyard, and it lights up. There are amazing artifacts and art from Mexican artists talking about Katrina and other Dia de los Muertos traditions all around the gallery. Uh, it's one of my favorite galleries in uh, Epcot. Uh, with good reason. I mean, look at this. It's Miguel de Ofrenda with Dante. So with a much loved attraction and a pretty cool gallery that does land this pavilion a four out of five as pavilions go on attractions. Entertainment wise, Mexico features live music with the amazing Mariachi Cobre, one of my favorite bands that performs in Epcot. I stop every time to listen to them because they are so spectacular. And there is a character meet and greet here as well where you can meet Donald Duck, but three caballeros Donald Duck with his sombrero, and this is such a fun meet and greet. Uh, it's always so silly and goofy, and some of my favorite pictures are from meeting Donald here. So between Mariachi Cobra and Donald Duck, the Mexico Pavilion gets a four out of five on entertainment as well. Food-wise, there's actually a ton of food options here in the Mexico Pavilion. There's the table service, La Hacienda de San Angel, that is right on the water. There's Chosa de Margarita. There's, right around this corner, a quick service, La Cantina de San Angel. Though most of these spots are not considered top of top tier restaurants here in Epcot, they are um, pretty popular. They serve pretty solid Mexican food. Mexico typically has the best festival booth, um, or one of the best at least. Drinks wise, you've got Chosa de Margarita, which does have some food offerings, but it also has frozen margaritas that are absolutely delicious. And one of my favorite bars and one of the most popular bars in all of Disney World is located inside the pyramid. La Cava del Tequila is inside the pyramid and offers absolutely amazing margaritas. They're expensive, but boy, are they worth it. One of my favorite places to grab drinks in all of Disney World. And as if that wasn't enough, there's also San Angel Inn, which is a table service restaurant located inside the pyramid with one of the most amazing immersive themed views that you can find. No matter what time you're here, San Angel Inn lets you dine outside under the stars in the view of Mexican pyramid in the distance. So pretty neat. Mexico also brings us our best rated theming out of any of the pavilions with a totally immersive pyramid both inside and out. When you're inside, it feels like wandering through a night market in Mexico with views in the distance. And outside, you can see the amazing pyramid all around World Showcase. It's totally a stunner, an eye catcher. Um, so it's hard to beat the theming. So theming wise, you got it, gonna be a five out of five. And as you can probably tell by how busy it is in here, this is a very popular pavilion as well. And in fact, this is one of the most popular pavilions, mostly thanks to Grand Fiesta Tour and La Cava del Tequila. That means that this one is going to get a five out of five on popularity. All in, the Mexico Pavilion lands comfortably in second place with a score of 22 out of 25. Bonjour, mes amis. Mm -hmm. Et bienvenue à the France Pavilion. France! Oh, he's, he's Miss Universe. Our number one pavilion winner, Sage and I have met up to present France! <laughs> France! 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 This oh is, my goodness. This is crazy that this is the number one pavilion. Well, well, there's actually something wild about this one's score, but we'll get to what its actual score is in a minute. Okay. We gotta talk about the individual details first. Let's do this. Um, all right, France, attractions-wise, does have the highest ranking, and with good reason. Not only does this pavilion have Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, of course, is a uh, trackless dark ride where you go into the story um, after, the, after the movie Ratatouille wraps up and you're shrunk down to the size of a mouse. It's super, super fun. Or a rat, I'm sorry. Rats are bigger than mice. Rat and, and sometimes often dirtier. It, often dirtier. On top of that, this pavilion is also home to two shows. Yes, two. One theater, two shows. You can see Beauty and the Beast sing-along, which is a relatively popular show because who doesn't love to sing along to the Beauty and the Beast songs? 
and at certain times of night you can often see Impressions of France, which is a show that shows scenes from France and a lot of information about France, which is very beautiful as well. But uh, that is three full attractions, three attractions. In addition to that, there's also my favorite gallery and world showcase, which is the French literature from page to stage and screen gallery, which you can see in the waiting area for Beauty and the Beast Sing Along. That makes for three and a half attractions, really, more than any other pavilion, giving this our top rating of attractions of five out of five. That brings us to our next category of entertainment. Now, there isn't a lot of entertainment here, but there are uh, two princess meet and greets. Uh, you can meet um, uh, Princess Aurora, kind of underneath her little gazebo, uh, and Belle, uh, because France, it's a little, a little town, it's a quiet village. It is. Now, uh, as we've been talking about throughout this entire World Showcase uh, ranking, each of these um, meet and greets, they are outdoors, which means if you want to meet either of these princesses, uh, you, will, you might be waiting outside in the hot sun for just a little bit. Let's talk about where the real magic is, though. Uh, in the food, France actually has more restaurants than any other pavilion in World Showcase. There is an incredibly popular bakery with Layal in the very back of the pavilion. There's L'Artisan de Glace, which is an incredibly popular ice cream spot. You've got a very, very popular festival booth, often considered one of the best uh, when the festivals are going. There's Les Vins de Chef de France, which is a booth where you can get one of the most popular cocktails in World Showcase with the Laurent Slushy. Laurence. Laurence. There's Chef de France, which is a table service restaurant that's relatively popular, featuring French cuisine. And they've even added more restaurants with Le Creperie de Paris, another table service restaurant that serves crepes and galettes. And then there is a walk-up window that goes with the creperie as well, where you can get crepes to go. Way more restaurants than anywhere else. And every single one of them is popular and well-liked. There's also Monsieur Paul, which similar to Takumi Te in Japan, is an incredibly schwanky, very fancy restaurant. It is fine dining at its finest. Well, maybe not its finest, but incredibly fine. Um, extremely expensive. Pretty much think around like $200 per person. Yeah, $195 for the menu. Did you and Breed Love try this? Breed Love and I did try it, and you can check out a review of it on the channel. Um, I really loved it. Uh, but this is something that most pavilions don't have as a fine dining establishment. It's only Japan and France. So that also plays into that five out of five rating. Now let's get into theming. Uh, France is definitely the, the biggest. I'd say, I'd say, uh, the one that's the second biggest is Japan, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this is definitely the biggest, specifically because of their addition. When we, uh, when Remy's Ratatouille Adventure was welcomed into the France Pavilion, we have a whole second level to the back now that just adds this in entire uh, depth to France. Also, Eiffel Tower. Yes, and then there's the Eiffel. <laughs> Thanks, Quincy. <laughs> and then there's uh, what Disney does best, which is a forced perspective uh, with their architecture. Uh, so because of all this, I'm going to give it a four out of five. A four out of five. Yeah. So all those together, we got to add popularity. As you can probably tell, popular. she's popular. It's pretty much always like this. France is packed any time of day. The restaurants are popular. It's hard. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little difficult to get reservations at Chefs de France. Uh, Remy's Rock to Adventure is one of the most popular rides in the park. The sure festival is. booth typically has a longer wait than other festival booths. Everything is popular here. You're already popular. Including us. <laughs> For that reason, this being one of the most popular pavilions, if not the most popular pavilion, this is gonna get a five out of five on that popularity scale, bringing us to a total of, interestingly, 22 points, exactly the same as Mexico. Wait, wait, how, okay, so why are you putting this first? Because of reader feedback. France tipped just a little bit over based on reader feedback. So it does make sense that France uh, topped out, I think because, specifically because of the attractions alone. Yeah. While Three Cal the Grand Fiesta Tour is one of my favorite attractions. Frozen is definitely amazing, but there's just not that much else going on in Norway. Correct. So France, it's the biggest pavilion. There's the most here. It's gonna be our winner today. There it is. If you like this video, go ahead and like and subscribe. Now go watch our complete tour of Epcot to see more of these pavilions. France! Oh, again? My <laughs> eardrum.